just all going just a little bit of implants. static electricity yeah a little bit yeah. of static electricity where it just makes their hair rise up give them yeah, a bad hair day yeah. <laughs> 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 Chuck, that's what you get for taking 30 minutes to do your hair <laughs> okay so, he's not even here we're making fun of him no no we're still doing it but okay welcome back to a nas bonus episode in this episode we're talking about cabinet of curiosities i'm your host daniel desangre i am jose ramos I am Marie. I forgot to change my name again, but <laughs> I'm just Marie right now. That's actually her nickname is Marie. Hello, Marie. Not my name again. again. <laughs> yeah, Marie, I forgot to change my name again. Just, just by now, it should be my name. <laughs> and I am George. Yeah, you are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, one and only. Yeah. Yes. I, I yes. wish that were true, but I'm one of many Georges in my family. <laughs> Can't even like, like original. that football card where everybody I'm, has it. Yeah, <laughs> they're everywhere. I'm, I'm the second George. George second to his name, third by an offshoot. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, the, out, yeah. One of the episodes in the past, <laughs> Jose was talking about uh, how there's always a, a Jose. Me and Jose went to high school together. Our freaking vice principal sophomore year, freshman or sophomore year, he would always call me Jose. He would see uh, us together. He'd be like, hey, Jose. Hi, Jose. I was like, my name's George. What the hell? I'm guilty, I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of calling you Jose. Yeah. <laughs> you does. call me Jose? It's the, J, it's the J. It's the Jorge. That's what it is. It's that. It's like, I don't know. Because there isn't I'm enough sorry. Jose's in the world already. People are adding more. I'm like, no, I've got enough competition. Yeah, we need fifty percent population to be named Jose. Yeah. <laughs> At least Less you don't think we're it. brothers. That's okay. Oh my god! In the last podcast, the guy <laughs> thought me and George were brothers just because we're both Hispanics, and we're like, "Why? None of you guys Hispanics? look alike. Like uh, you're both Latino. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, no, none of you guys look alike <laughs> at all. I don't think so, but. Anyway, so in this episode, we want to talk about the Cabinet Curiosities. This is a show that I would say each of us are uber excited to watch. Um, for me, you know, it's HP Lovecraft and it's Guillermo del Toro. Two huge combos. Uh, Guillermo del Toro is obviously a huge fan of HP Lovecraft. So I felt like the dedication he was going to put into this project was going to be super stellar. How did you guys feel about it? Oh, yeah, I totally agree. As a fellow you know, Lovecraftian person, I got my Lovecraft books. I love Guillermo. Guillermo brings a visual style that you know is going to lend itself to Lovecraft, whether it's mm -hmm. going to be the creatures or just the ambiance of every story. It's going to be nailed every time, even if the, the writing isn't strong. Visually, you can just watch it and you're going to be intrigued mm -hmm. and most likely scared. Mary? I was excited going in. I was excited. I knew it was going to be like a very like, spooky but like fantastical journey but are are they only two of them were lovecraft ones that weren't they or mm -hmm. is yeah. that right yeah yeah okay i can yeah. say about that <laughs> 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 i feel bad about that but okay no. uh no, I I, uh, I I agree as soon as i saw Guillermo del Toro was kind of attached to it and the fact like this you know, was his, his baby, his, his little project where he like handpicked everything. He handpicked the stories, the directors and all of that stuff. Uh, I definitely have a huge respect for Guillermo, even with his flaws uh, that he does have. So then when I heard that uh, he wasn't going to be involved with all the writing in this, mm -hmm. but kind of just going to oversee everything, I got a little more excited about the possible mm -hmm. quality because writing is not his strength uh, in general. <laughs> uh, but that was kind of like my thoughts, uh, you know, going in. Okay. So, um, Jose, do you want to tell us a little bit about what the show is for the audience that hasn't watched it yet or heard of it? Yeah, it's on Netflix. So anyone who has Netflix, you can check it out. They're all out there. You can binge them. Uh, it's eight episodes uh, overall. Um, it has a variety of hand-picked directors. Uh, just in case we don't talk about all the episodes, I feel we should still give the respect to all the directors involved. Uh, and some names I may butcher, but we had like uh, Anna Lily Amipour, yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Catherine Hardwick. We had uh, Vicencio Natali. We had Keith Thomas, uh, David Pryor, Guillermo Navarro, uh, Panos Cosmatos, and Jennifer Kent. Uh, some of these we already knew from other projects. Some of them, this is the first time I was seeing their work. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, this was all curated and handpicked by Guillermo hims himself. 
and it pretty much uh, all leans into horror, like these little short stories that were put together. Um, I feel like that. Yeah, that describes it all. Anything else you guys want to add to it? I'd say it, it would also like each episode felt like a movie. It felt yes. like a, a nice self-contained movie. A, I, a I didn't feel like I was watching a TV show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's very yeah. versatile. Each one was so different from the from yeah. the previous one. I like that aspect. And it, it, you could totally tell he got his inspiration from the Hitchcock show. Like yeah. even with the intro where he walks out and kind of talks mm-hmm. to the audience. I dug that. I thought it was super cool. I was a fan of the Hitchcock show too. So I really liked what Guillermo del Toro, how he approached his project. Even when I was watching some of the trailers for it and even the directors that you're mentioning, Jose, it gave you a lot of insight because even though a lot of them have done horror before, they're very different styles that they've directed. And even the episodes that we watched completely felt like that. Like you saw that it it sort of redefines what horror is. And you saw different elements of how horror is presented to you. And I thought that was really cool. And, and I agree with that. I, <clears throat> when I go into an anthology, like for me, um, I expect to have some duds. It's I don't think I've ever seen an anthology that did not have duds in it. If as long as more than 50 percent of the episodes are good, then I'm happy usually with an anthology. But mm-hmm. all the other thing I'm looking for is, uh, like you mentioned, is is there a difference between episodes? Can you see different styles? Can you separate them from each other or is it all just replicas of the same thing? Uh, and I feel this one was able to accomplish it, and we'll get more into details regarding that. Perfect. Okay. Um, I, I know we kind of already touched on what we thought. Should we go get into standout episodes? Yeah. Perfect. All right. Uh, Marie, you want to start us off? What was your standout episode? Okay. My standout episode was The Outside. Okay. And... I, uh, <laughs> I have some four, and that was directed by uh, I'm gonna butcher it too. Was it Anna Lily Amirpour? And she directed A Girl Walks Home at Night, which I've never seen, and now I want to see it. I've heard of it. It's like a vampire type movie, but I want to watch it now because of this. So I don't want to say that this episode. I don't want to be like as a girl. This one really, but like seriously, I think <laughs> I, I think I cried a little bit during this episode because I'm like, oh my god, this hits home. But okay, this episode. First of all. The fact that they made Stacy a taxidermist, I think was one like the most brilliant decision ever because basically she kills things full of life, strips them of their insides and their eyes, which are like the windows of the soul and stuffs them with like artificial substance and like preserves them for like to be beautiful as these like soulless, lifeless decorations. And that's what she ends up doing to herself. So I was just like, oh, <laughs> I love that aspect. <laughs> the colors of it in it are so good. There's certain like angles and shots that were so good. And um, I think it's a, such a relatable episode, not just to women, to men too. Um, and, you know, you'll do anything to be perfect and beautiful. And even if it robs you of your happiness. And I just thought that was a very relatable horror aspect. I thought that episode was one of probably the, in my opinion, one of the better directed episodes. Yeah. I thought it was done really well. The color palette, like you said, of the, mm-hmm. of the, of the show was really good. Mm-hmm. I really dug how they did the character. They had really good character development in the show. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a little bit of issues with the ending, but I really liked the dynamics that they set up with the characters. And I know what the ending, I know what they were going for. It's mm-hmm. still kind of a little vague, because you can incorporate, you, you can interpret it in so many different ways, in my opinion. Just because you don't know if it's playing with surrealism or if it's playing with on the head and on the nose, and this is literally what happened. There's a few different ways you can kind of see it, but I, I thought I thought it was very creative. I like the idea of the stripping down of what your perception of beauty is and what you mm-hmm. think how you need to be valued versus how you value yourself, and you kind of see the complexity of that broken down. So I liked it. Martin Starr was so good in it and he was so sweet to her and he could tell her over and over again you're perfect to me you're perfect you're this that and she's like you're just trying to make it so I'm not happy you don't understand and that's just like it's so relatable man oh that part that (laughs) part was making me so mad I'm like listen to him yeah Uh, (laughs) oh I I I did have uh some issues with this episode uh one I 
feel it felt like a shorter story that just got stretched out to fit the like 40 45 minutes uh so in certain parts if it, it felt like it could have been shortened up a little bit and just kind of been cleaner in this presentation so that was one of the things where at certain parts i'm like ah this probably would have worked better maybe a 25 minute like short um and then while he did a good job i just he kept going in and out of his accent so much that it was like throwing me off uh, when he was doing his accent it was like sometimes it'll be really strong and then they'll kind of fade out a little bit so that was you're kind talking of about martin star martin yeah. star gotcha yeah so he was going a little bit in and out, but she did a great job with her performance. Um, you can see the the vulnerability there. You can see the confusion between, uh, you know, what she wanted to be and then the struggle of trying to get there and the slow progression of how she interacts with Martin's character from being easily uh, reassured, like when she thinks that, uh, someone's in the house and she calls him to get so he can just say like everything's okay there's no mm -hmm. one there how easy it was for her to be reassured by his words at the beginning and just how that slowly got chipped away and faded to the end where everything he said had the opposite effect on her mm -hmm. and she was taken mm -hmm. as an attack so in that aspect in the writing actually was really good in the way it portrayed mm -hmm. some of those things mm -hmm. good points george uh, this was one of the episodes for me that I struggled in the good way of whether it was going to be my number one episode or not. And it went back and forth for me. I, I'm with you, Marie. Definitely one of my favorites. And, and it's all it's all the relatability. Like, I obviously related more with Martin Starr's character at times. <laughs> you know? You poor men. That, you poor men. Trying so hard to make us feel better. And we're like, but, okay. Yeah. And it's also <laughs> one of those things, like, as you watch it, like, I, I watched it again. And I was just like, that second viewing, it's like, yeah, he's saying the words. And you know he does care, because if he didn't care, he wouldn't stay. But at the mm -hmm. same time, the physical actions, it's like he doesn't, he's not looking at her when he talks to her. He's, he doesn't even, he'll hang up the phone on her when he, when he said, trying to confirm her. It's like, hey, don't worry, there's no one there at the house. You're by yourself. Mm -hmm. But then he hangs up and he's like, oh my, like, you get that sense of like, oh my God, this again? You know? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, mm -hmm. maybe if you guys were doing things together, then she wouldn't have felt this way but you guys mm -hmm. are just going through the motions it's and it's like as someone like i'm over 10 years into my relationship and luckily things are still great but you have those days where it's just like you're kind of just robots and you're going through the, the motions mm -hmm. of like this is our day this is what we do and i felt that i felt that in every moment with their relationship it's like mm -hmm. man and then at the end when she mm -hmm. when she kills him i felt bad but at the same time, it's like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's she's killing that last piece of her that would have kept her down and would have kept her mm -hmm. from yeah. being who she's about to become, that beautiful butterfly, per se. Yeah. <laughs> but it I, but the thing I love the most is that it reminded me of a Twilight Zone episode, the Eye of the Beholder, mm -hmm. where like mm -hmm. everyone in the world is ugly and this mm -hmm. one person is beautiful, but she thinks she's ugly. It totally mm -hmm. brought me to that episode. Great and, episode, by the way. Yeah, and I love Twilight yeah. Zone. Twilight Zone's a freaking yeah. one of the yeah. best anthology shows. Mm -hmm. I I wanted to throw in because you mentioned it. Uh, that that was that scene was really heartbreaking. At the end, when yeah. when she when she strikes him, the fact that like he cares about her so much that he still doesn't realize that she just tried to kill him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he's <laughs> yeah. still like, oh, what happened? Like, mm -hmm. help give me like some help. He he's not processing the fact that like she this was just attempted murder. And he still yeah. thinks it's like an accident or she slipped mm -hmm. or whatever. Like to his final breath, he was like, no, she wouldn't kill me. She wouldn't do this to me. Yeah. And that was like kind of yeah. heartbreaking because like he died not knowing that she was trying to kill him. Yeah. Yeah. Fully devoted. And I still. Yeah, to sort of touch one on George was talking about, it's interesting in this one because he's saying the words of comforting to her, but you never saw the action of him necessarily trying to comfort her. So you sort of kind of go into that, like what you're saying, that robotic phase where is she being reassured? Because they've been with each other for years. Has he been giving her that? Because his attention is always dedicated to television. He even has his microwavable meals that he has. Yep. Everything <laughs> is so processed. They live in such a processed mm -hmm. world. 
that sometimes he just they're just sort of going through the emotions. I know I felt that he does love her and care for her, but at what cost? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, is he sacrificing his own self to make her feel better about it? We don't really know. Or is she just crazy and just nothing was, you know, nothing was satisfying her, making her feel good. And and maybe this is many years of him physically trying to attempt to do that and just getting shut down. And this is just where they're at now. It's really interesting to see where they are in their relationship and how they've kind of evolved from that. So it's it was a good reflection, man. It was, yeah. it was, I really dug the episode, too. It was in my top four favorites. I, I was also when I first watched it as I was going through the episodes, I thought, OK, this one might be my favorite. And then as I watched a few other ones, they kind of started shifting. And you know how, how when especially when you come to these anthology shows, right when you watch them, you'll have an idea of your ranking. And then when you step away, they'll kind of shift a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then the ones that kind of resonate and sit with you are the ones that start rising up. Like, okay, that, that was done really, really well. So I think this one ended up dropping a little bit down for me, but it was still in my top four. Still really, really good. I just thought some of the other ones, they just tackled the horror element a little bit better. And in this one, the horror was more in her mind, more than an actual physical horror creature. Unless if you consider the lotion thing, monster thing, I'm not really yeah, sure. Which it could still be in her mind. <laughs> in her mind, yeah. Yeah. In my opinion, it, it is because yeah. it, it's physically impossible for that stuff to have been fixed. And that and that's sort of what I mean about this is you have the ending where everything was sort of in her mind. OK, but then what was the reality? Because there's no way her teeth and her eyes would have been fixed by a lotion, by a skin thing. Yeah. So. How exactly how what happened? Right. I mean, if she ended up murdering her husband, she did. But there's no way she walked into work and all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, my God, you're beautiful. And she's being elevated and you get the nice orange <laughs> lights being, you know, broadcasted yeah. on her. OK, but what was the reality? And that was it's the done. only issue that I that I had with the ending was I wanted to see what the reality element was, even if they cut away or we showed it in some kind of mere reflection. I just wanted to see something. It's the um, Urko Stefan effect. <laughs> it was yeah. just, it was, all you need is confidence it, and that's it. it was a change yeah. of belief in yeah. thinking mm -hmm. that it worked <laughs> yeah that's it <laughs> good yeah. reference good reference yeah the ending made me think of uh requiem like every time okay. the, the mom so? was in the game show mm -hmm. oh and yeah like that how, how she perceived herself in the game mm -hmm. show she was just like mm -hmm. this beautiful woman who was a winner yep and yep. that's that's what i saw when it came to the end yeah. and the yellow lights and everything mm -hmm. and yep. being yeah yeah no it, was it that. did. It felt like that. But what I love that Requiem did was we also saw the outside layer. Of yeah, it. we knew she so was sick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. With this one, we know it's her mind and her imagination. Obviously, I just I really, really wanted to see something. If it was just a hint of it, that would have gone so far for me in terms of my ranking system for it. Yeah. It would have shot up very high. I think that, that crack. Only... I think the crack was the reality when she's laughing, and she's yeah. like, ha ha ha, and you see her like. Yeah, it's like the pain. That moment, that's it. That's that's mm -hmm. the thing. It's like, hey, inside something's still, still wrong. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I will, I will say with this one because I did a second viewing to refresh because I finished this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this one actually went up my ranking on the second viewing. I was able to appreciate mm -hmm. it more the second time around. George, want to go next? Uh, sure. So. This was not necessarily my number one episode, but it, it's something that just resonated with me. And mm -hmm. it's going to be the the Pikmin's model. Anyone who knows me, especially in this group, oh, I think it's obvious why it resonated with me. It has, has to do with art, uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, but it's that I liked how how haunting the art was like the actual mm -hmm. whoever the artist was mm -hmm. who did the stuff for that, which I actually happen to follow on my Instagram. So I should have it in my head, but I don't. But. I, I loved it. And it, the whole episode made me think of scary stories to tell in the dark. Mm -hmm. And like, remember the, the art for that book by Stephen Gamble? No, it was it's amazing. Like that, loved I, it. I still have that art in my head. It's embedded mm -hmm. in there oh, yeah. forever. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't have nightmares from it, but it's in mm -hmm. there. It's not, it's not mm -hmm. leaving. So I love that idea of like art being so haunting that it just consumes you. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. And we're all artists and different facets different mediums mm -hmm. so we i think each of us gets that that sense of once we see that thing it's just eating you up inside granted for this yeah. man it brought him down a dark path and not, not something he wanted to live in but anyone who's in a, a creative space can understand what that's like though to just be mm -hmm. engulfed with that thought of just that thing that's forever yeah. in in your head in that darkness 
And then when you get to see the creature at the end, it's like, oh, this is it. That And that's what made it really feel like a scary story from the book. Like, it could have been one of those stories where the man mm-hmm. finds out, it's like, holy snap, this isn't just made up. They're freaking real. And, yeah. and now it's like, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> This this one was uh one of the Lovecraft adaptations. Yes, yeah. Uh mm-hmm. on this one. Um I think out of all of them, the concept of this one was the one that originally uh uh resonated with me the most. I love the the concept of it. Um I think one of the things I really liked about it, and you touched on that, George, is by this whole time they give you this impression that uh, these paintings are having this negative effect on him and now he's like either going crazy or um, he's picturing all these things from the painting like he's making it real and then kind of to find out at the end that the paintings had nothing to do with it it was just kind of his connection to the guy and now they were making themselves appear to him and actually following him not hiding from him and that was the situation the whole time so I felt like that was a good twist. And then I, I loved the dark ending. The ending was so dark. Mm. That oh I was, my God. I was yeah. like, I was like, that is up. But I liked that it's up because you didn't you didn't sugarcoat <laughs> it. You didn't go cookie cutter. You were just like, you know what? Here it is. Uh so that little like shock value, I didn't expect them to go that far. Uh, when they got to it, and I appreciated that they didn't hold back. It, it which is something you don't see usually with uh, American horror. You see more with foreign horror. Mm-hmm. So it, mm-hmm. it gave me that. That's one of the things I appreciate about foreign horror is we're going to give you what we're going to give you. We're not going to hold back. And then you react and you feel the way you feel about it. Yeah, no, I absolutely. And with that, with that episode, I dug it a lot too. I like the idea how they really went into the mindset of an artist because as an artist, you you it's very isolated, right? You're by yourself creating this art and it's very vulnerable putting yourself out there. So you always see that struggle between confidence and lack thereof. And even our main guy that was heralded in his class as the best artist still struggled with that. And that was the fascination that he had with the Crispin Glover character. Shout out to him. He did a great job in this. Um but you see that and you see him with his confidence and how he's getting stuck on this, this horror element of it and how it's stuck in his mind. I thought this one had probably some of the better visual horror mm-hmm. that we saw throughout yeah. the series. And that's the good thing about all of these episodes is that there's always good things to pull from them. I don't think any of these episodes were just completely bad. I just think some were just better than others. Some uh. maybe we personally didn't love as much as others. <laughs> what happened? Uh, I heard. I think there was a wince somewhere, like, <laughs> somewhere in the distance. I heard a wince. I, I don't know somewhere up north. <laughs> but I think, uh, for the most part, with this, the the directors really got the opportunity to display their own voice, and you see that within these episodes. And I thought with this one, they really tackled the mindset of an artist and i thought they they did a really good job with that and it was really cool to combine the visual element of the filmmaking with it with the actual storyline so good stuff uh marie how about you how'd you feel about it oh um this one was like mid-grade for me i was like yeah it's, a, it's good it, but i agree had the most uh, visually disturbing scenes and imagery and the ending i was like they're gonna do this aren't they they're gonna do this and they <laughs> did that and i'm like that's when the motherly instincts kick in and i'm like the stupid episode (laughs) (laughs) but But, it left you right it disturbed you yeah it did did i walked away pissed off so that was a good thing (laughs) the the fact that she was like chopping her fingers like carrots at the end oh i was like i was like that doesn't sound like vegetables (laughs) (laughs) that part i loved and the eyeballs out the eyeballs out Mm -hmm. i was like oh dope visual dope visual yeah that was awesome Mm -hmm. okay um Jose you want to do your standout that uh yeah so I guess my standout one was uh the autopsy uh Mm -hmm. in this one um so this one it was based off a short story it wasn't based off a Lovecraft um this one is just first of all the performance by um F Murray Abraham he had me fully engaged from the beginning even just the banter between him and the sheriff you can see that camaraderie like they're old friends 
who are too old for this shit at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah. You you really see see that there. Um, this just especially towards the second half, it does such a good job to build tension. Uh, you know, and and little by little, especially once he when he starts doing the autopsy through it. Um, and you know something's gonna happen, but it was like, when is this gonna happen? It just slowly escalates until that body is like popping out of the of the little gurney thing and coming at him. Ooh. Um, some of the shots in this by the director were amazing, and that added to the tension. Um, this is especially when you get some of the shots from inside the area where all the bodies are, even though our lead character is not in there yet. And you see him kind of coming through the door. Like, it's such a cool shot. There's a little bit of fogginess there. The the lighting. It just, the whole atmosphere of this was great. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I liked about this, and we see this throughout the other episodes, is they spent time uh, getting into visual detail of seeing people do their craft. Um, you know, we saw it in The Outsider with the taxidermy. We see her actually going through the process. You know, they're not panning away and they're not like, oh, no, she did it. She stuffed the duck. Um, you know, we <laughs> we see it here with the autopsy where we actually seen him going through the process. We saw it with the paintings where this that scene where we actually see him go through. Process. I really appreciate when we were kind of it's like we were sitting there in the room with them watching them do this. They could easily have skipped through it. So I, I appreciated that. Um and then just the banter between him and this creature and how he was able to outsmart it um, mm. and just how visceral, visceral it got at the end where he was just kind of like, if I'm going down, I'm going to make sure you go down with me. There was just so much I appreciated, but the main thing was the performance that uh, the acting was on point beginning to end. Yeah, I, I agree. That one was probably my favorite out of all of them because it's a different horror that we have. It's the alien, right? It's it's supposed to be an intelligent creature that's smarter than him. So it's man outsmarting this something bigger than him, something uh, more intelligent than him. I love that element. And like you said, F. Murray was phenomenal in this. I really love the, the acting in it. I thought I thought he carried... It's so much harder when you have more limited characters in, a, in an episode like this. They have to do that much better to be able to carry it and keep you entertained. I thought he did a phenomenal job with that. The intellectual debate that he had with this alien was so clever on how they did it. It's just it that one was the one where I kind of walked away from like, OK, that one was good. It was a more simple story. But then the more I thought about it, I'm like, man, they did that so well. It was so good. And how the extent of he was willing to sacrifice his own body just to beat this alien. It was clever, man. It was a very different. There was of all of these eight episodes, some went the traditional route of horror with a creature. Some of them didn't. And this was one that was very different. It felt very Twilight Zone-ish to me was this episode. Yeah. And I dug it. I, I loved it as well for most of the same reasons you said, Jose. That one's good because it kind of switches up. Like it kind of is like horror and it feels like a haunting in a way. And then it goes mm -hmm. like sci-fi and then it goes psychological horror. So it has like all these genres wrapped mm -hmm. up into one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely the most cerebral of the bunch mm -hmm. it also it reminded me a lot i don't know if this has ever happened to any of y'all but like i've experienced night terrors where like you wake up in the night and you can't move mm -hmm. and you but you like you feel like you see things and everything like that but that 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 feeling of just being stuck and seeing him be like that and each guy it's like i know that feeling and it's it's so terrifying and then having to be in that and like you're and you but you can talk i like i've never been able to talk when that happens to me but he's been able to talk, but he can't do anything. And just mm -hmm. that idea of like, I I want to be able to stop this, but I can't. And it's like, what do I do right now? Yeah. And just all he has is his wits. And it's like, that's, yeah. and that's where age comes into play. If you had a younger guy, would the younger guy have been able to pull that off? Mm -mm. No, most likely not. It's like, you needed this guy who's lived a full life and who's mm -hmm. seen some to mm -hmm. be able to, to, to listen to what's happening and then use it to his advantage. Yeah, yeah. It, it's smart yeah. that you said that because the younger guy would have had ambition, exactly. right? I have ambitions. I have more things I need to do in life. F. Murray was like, nope, I did what I needed to do. I'm saving mankind, whether people know this or not. Yeah. I'm saving humanity. Well, well done. Sorry, Jose. Yeah. Well, I was going to say he was able to paralyze all his body so he doesn't, he's not becoming a danger, but he couldn't do anything about his most dangerous weapon, which was his mind. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what what thing? And I don't know um, if it was just me. I feel throughout this series in multiple episodes, like the tentacles were a thing. Oh yeah, because that, that's uh, so definitely he, a Cthulhu Lovecraft thing for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. but even in some episodes that weren't Lovecraft, like we kind of mm-hmm. saw it because this wasn't a Lovecraft, and we saw the alien creature had the tentacles. We saw it in thinking Lot Thirty Six, mm-hmm. the creature yeah. had the, even in the um, which was a Lovecraft, the uh, uh, Pikmin's model. You know, you see the octopus on the head. Uh, yeah. So I feel like there were some reoccurring themes throughout some of these episodes, uh, mm-hmm. even though they came from different sources. Mm-hmm. And and you could tell they were inspired by HP still. They still yeah. brought in exactly. some of those elements. Yeah. It's all so, eldritch horror kind of feel. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Cool. Anything else on that one? No. Yeah, it's good. on you, Dan. Yeah, Dan, what you got yeah, for so, us? Yeah, man. So the episode I'm going to talk about is not my favorite, but it's one that stood out for me from a visual standpoint. I thought they directed the hell out of this. It was episode seven, The Viewing, the one that was done by the director from Mandy. Yeah. That's the episode that I'm talking about where I can completely understand if somebody tells me this is their worst one. If they just didn't like it, I completely get it. If somebody tells me it's their favorite, I totally get it too. The visual elements that they did for this, it's not your traditional horror at all. They took a very different approach on this. They gave a Eric Andre was phenomenal in this. I loved him in this in this episode. I really dug how the director, again, he's the one that did Mandy, took such a different, unique style on this and just made it their own, regardless of the circumstances, because it's not your typical H.P. Lovecraft story at all. It's not even your typical traditional horror on how you tell it. You just see the 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 mind of the of these creative people, and each character is so diverse. And you see the fascination that this rich, wealthy man has and how even money and everything else that he has is not good enough. They're still striving for more. And you see the obsession that he has with it. And even the curiosity of man of sitting back and just watching getting killed by this creature and the face melting, which even had cool elements of that, too. And they still added the quirky comedy to this. I just thought it was so dope and visual. And I'm a huge stylistic guy. So. I can appreciate something that's more original rather than something that just copied a formulaic approach and just did it pretty good. If they just copy another formulaic approach and just did it good, it gets a little boring to me. Like I've seen this a thousand times. If you take a very stylistic approach on it, even if it all didn't necessarily work, I appreciate that because you gave it its own unique voice. Give me that. So I just wanted to count this one as a standout episode because out of all of them, out of all eight, this one was so clearly different on its own and it doesn't fit any of the other ones in my opinion mm-hmm. yeah with, with this one i feel um this was like a middle of the pack for me um i, I definitely appreciate the how stylized it was the color schemes that it used that that graininess the 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 music the synth music yeah. oh, my God. oh so, man so mm-hmm. all that a- atmosphere wise uh in in what it created this is one of the tops uh of it mm-hmm. um the dialogue for the most part actually was strong too with their interactions with some of them one of the characters i felt he was just like felt too off as the guy mm-hmm. from peacemaker um oh, oh, it just, it, yeah it didn't <laughs> seem to fit uh but the dialogue was pretty strong what brought this down for me at the end is i i didn't feel the payoff the payoff didn't hit for me at mm-hmm. the end. And that's what brought it down because throughout it, I was enjoying the process. I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, where are we going? This mm-hmm. is going to be good. <laughs> all right, they're going into the other room. And then the payoff happened and it just felt empty. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what dropped it down for me, even mm-hmm. though everything before then set it up very well. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with you on that. The ending, I was like, ah, I wish I would have done this. That's why I don't put it as my favorite, but I do wanted to highlight it and spotlight it for a standout episode because of the bold move the director made on how to tell the story. Because if some of the other directors would have done this, it's so easy because you see the horror, how they could have approached it. This one gave us a completely unique stylized way of doing this. And I commend that because again, either you're going to like it or you're going to not like it. It's very easy. I don't really see it being somewhere in the middle. I feel like you kind of sway on one of those sides. This is the episode I was the most excited for going into the series just because it was mm-hmm. directed by uh, the director, Mandy, which I also mm-hmm. loved. And the, this episode gave me the same feeling as Mandy did, which is what I wanted. And 
I, I thought about that episode for days and days afterwards, just because of how it made me feel and how it was so visually stunning. The retro synth, oh. <laughs> the lens, it. like like the lens flares, the colors, the color palette, like, oh God, that, that one. Yeah, that's my second favorite one. The music, sound, mm-hmm. design, everything, everything. It's all of that. And even with the lens flare, the orange oh. kept bleeding over faces when they yeah. were talking. And yes. I thought, yes, like, give me yes. that. That's what I'm talking about. Like, we don't even need to see the face of her talking bleed it out like it's the whole you felt like you were in the room with them with that synth music bleeding in and the lights bleeding in so even when they were doing the drugs you Mm -hmm. saw the even the shots and the flares were getting bigger they were kind of toying Mm -hmm. with you with you as a visual person viewing it and i just thought it was so well cleverly crafted it was so well made Mm -hmm. george yeah you definitely felt like you were getting uh distorted more as they went down there their their drug usage and everything mm-hmm. i i think for me this was definitely one of my lower ranked episodes mm-hmm. almost to the bottom i'd say mm-hmm. but it's, it's only because of story mm-hmm. i'm with mm-hmm. you on visuals this was the only one of the bunch where like i kind of wanted to go there like mm. they managed to somehow you make just wanted it... to do the drugs didn't you <laughs> you got me <laughs> one of the cleanest guys in the group wanted to do all the drugs <laughs> Uh, I, uh, no, but like, I, I thought it was amazing how they managed to, it's obviously retro. We're like in the late seventies or going about to head into early eighties, mm-hmm. but yet at the same time, it still felt futuristic. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like everything mm-hmm. still felt like technology that we, we still haven't touched yet. It, I thought that mm-hmm. was really amazing to pull that off. So I'm like, I'm watching. I was like, wait, what timeline are we? I'm seeing sideburns. Mm-hmm. I'm getting bell bottoms here, but yet why do I feel like I'm still like 10 years ahead of where I am yeah. now? <laughs> Oh. yeah so i loved all that mm-hmm. just like the visual design of everything like mm-hmm. i want to visit that set i want to be yeah. there and mm-hmm. see what that looked like because that mm-hmm. that seemed like the most fun to probably put together out of mm-hmm. out of everything mm-hmm. yeah and i to actually I, I be on set that would have yeah. been fun to yeah film. and like even like the characters like of all the characters from every episode this is the bunch i would have wanted to sit with and mm-hmm. talk to not the actors but the characters themselves mm-hmm. because they they probably had some of the most like fleshed out people out of everyone I yeah think, like everyone felt unique mm-hmm. as opposed to everything else which was in a certain timeline where it's like mm-hmm. you guys are kind of all the same like you stick out but not enough while with these yeah. people it's like no you are all individuals and you can see yep. it immediately and then when they start talking you get it yeah 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 and yeah, I, that and, uh oh sorry go ahead. i was like and if there was enough intrigue too or like until we got to the end i was wondering it's like what's gonna happen why mm-hmm. are they here? Yeah, like same, they're all same. so different. Like, why do you need the freaking astrophysicist and the music guy? Like, what? How are these two coming together for whatever you have for them? <laughs> Jose. I, I was going to say that uh, <laughs> that wall there. That's basically like that's what came before the iPod. That was how you used to have to <laughs> yeah. uh, have a play a playlist. All the all this music on this one wall. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. A computer used to yeah. be that room, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's hit up weakest one. So, George, you want to start us off with this one? What was the one that was your most bottom episode? <laughs> well, I guess we'll continue on this one. It's the viewing. It's the <laughs> 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 And it's because that story, the story kind of just went nowhere. It was mm-hmm. it, it had the build up but not the payoff, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Like I just, it, it was too bad, too bad. Like and I know for others this might be higher, but mm-hmm it kind of fell flat even though like that it was intense at the end like them trying to get Mm -hmm. to that car and drive away it still was just Mm -hmm. like all right so there was a rock and now it's is it going to take over the world okay okay. that's yeah that seemed like a waste to have them there so they did nothing Mm -hmm. these 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 special people you got did nothing (laughs) yeah but initiate the thing (laughs) they they fed it they fed it yeah they fed it yeah oh well i mean I, i feel we've already talked about yeah, this we one talked. we can probably go yeah. on to to the next one um mine was um dreams in the witch house now again i know you said earlier that there was yeah. no bad one in this this was my bad one <laughs> this one uh... <laughs> is bad okay okay this one is my least favorite as well. I'm right there with you, but there's still something really badass that was in this. That's why I say none of them were complete, completely bad, where you walked away saying nothing worked for me. Yeah. There was always something you can pull out of something, I felt mm-hmm. like. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. The one thing I can pull out of this one 
was the witch design. Yes. Uh, yes. The witch design was cool. <laughs> hey, that was the only thing I got. That's that about as far as it goes. And the rat, one. the rat was cool. No, I no, hated the no, rat. No, I just hated that rat. the rat. That's, my, that's the reason the why I hated it. Yeah. That's, that's boy, the one Congress. why I hated I hated it. I can't do it. <laughs> no, I don't think the rat design that. was rat. cool. I think the idea that the rat won, that he, that no. the bad guy won. Bad actor, bad character. I bad did not look. like the design of it at all. <laughs> no, that took me so yeah. out of that episode. Hated and, it. And, it, and that's okay. I mean, that was one of my knocks on this. It was like the the rat was just weird. The rat was annoying. Every time the rat got on screen, it took away from everything. Especially when we're in this other world, and there and the witch is coming after him, and she looks cool, and then the rat pops up, and it's like, all right. <laughs> Yes. There we go. Just <laughs> took the tension just yes. out of the room completely. Yes. For so a bad rat... joke. Like bad jokes. Yeah. Like you're throwing yeah. in bad cheesy jokes. Like, no, nah, this is not working for me. Mm-hmm. And here it is. I don't wanna I don't wanna pigeonhole this uh director. Do I it. Find, I find out after <laughs> that this was director of the first Twilight. And yep. I was like, Oh, shows, what a coincidence. Because I hated that one too. Uh, <laughs> so so I don't I don't know if I'll be seeing any future Catherine Hardwick uh, projects. Well, she did something good too, though, didn't she? She did Lords of Dogtown. Lords of Dogtown that was, was okay. That wasn't bad. She no, did something, Thirteen. Something, Thirteen. That's the movie that 13. was good. Yeah, like that's probably okay. one of like my t- yeah. top standout indie films for like. A I liked her with those two until she did Twilight, and then it's just been like, oh man, uh, I don't know. Big box office, so, not good. No. So she yeah. she's on a Shyamalan streak. So started off <laughs> yes, out and then yes. going down. Uh, better um, as an indie director. Yeah. So my my other big problems with this is one, honestly, the story was just not interesting at all. I no. This is the only one that I find myself looking at my phone, checking my mm-hmm. text. I checked mm-hmm. work email during this one. And you never check e- work emails. You never uh, check work emails. Yeah. I check. I was like, hey, I wonder what's going on uh, with work after hours. Uh, <laughs> after hours. <laughs> yeah. It just, uh, it wasn't interesting. And then the main character, and this had nothing to do with the actor. The actor, mm-hmm. I felt, did what he can with what he was given. But the... Uh, the way this character was written was just very one dimensional, not interesting at all. There was no growth or shift with this character at all throughout it. Who this character was the beginning. They were that at the end, all the way into they lost. Um, And it was just one track, one dimensional. This was like the T 1000 of getting your sister back. And like, that's, (laughs) that was his full focus. The whole time, it just there wasn't much to the character, uh. So, this was my my bad one. I can mm-hmm. pull more good things out of all the other ones. This is the one where that's my one good thing from it. Yes, agreed. Marie, also my dad is that one, and mm-hmm. his character was so unlikable. I wasn't rooting mm-hmm. for him to get his sister back. I'm like, stop being selfish. Like this is just terrible. I knew going into it again. Well, I didn't know. I thought this is the director of Twilight. I don't like the Twilight entire franchise. I've only seen a couple, but no. But I was like, I I, I thought it was going to be more juvenile, a little more for teenagers maybe. Um, and it kind of felt that way. I That rat, just if that's in like the the actual story, if there's actual, I don't know, it didn't translate well to screen. You can't, you can't put that. Rat. This was a Lovecraft like, one, also. It, I thought so, right? I'm like, th- yeah. this just shouldn't have been put on a screen. I don't think if you want to have a rat with the human face in your mind, like maybe that could come across. But like putting it up there with this voice is being all, and I'm like, hey, no, I don't like you. Like, don't I don't like that. Rat. And the actor, like the actor they cast yeah, for like, it, just, like come on, yeah, it's, no. I, no, it's a no. It's a no for me, dog. I fast forwarded um, once they were in that like the church and they were like doing all this like voodoo stuff or whatever. I was like, let's just fast forward it to like the end. And besides, <laughs> yeah, Damn. I that was my major mega mm-hmm. dud. Yeah, give, give it the old Chuck like one point five. I did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's I, I don't even think she did one point five. Huh? You just skip chapters. <laughs> yeah, I was like, right to the end. All right, and okay. I was like, oh. Yeah. Um. She, I mean, I, I don't want to repeat what both of you guys have said. It was my biggest dud as well. The rat is the one that kept taking me out of it. I yeah. thought Rupert Grint for the most point, uh, most part, he tried. I think it was just the character just wasn't flushed out correctly. No. It was the pacing of it. It just didn't make sense where he was obsessed with getting his sister back, but his attempts at doing it throughout these years felt very weak. 
you were just trying to find somebody that was sort of like clairvoyant or whatever it was. But I don't know, man, that rat just kept taking me <laughs> out of it. And at the end, when it won, I was just like, no, like <laughs> that was the worst for me. I was like, I can't stand this character. And the fact that it was based off of HP Lovecraft, is really disheartening considering it that it's my least favorite out of the entire mm -hmm. anthology that sucks because <laughs> that sucks. witch and the rats they, they like the witch and the rat didn't go together as like a group like as a coupling like that's his no. overall sidekick like that, they're they're so disconnected in every single way i'm just like it doesn't make yeah it doesn't feel and, right and it's the witch off. the witch visually looked amazing but then you add the rat and it sort of brought the personality of the witch down. You know what I'm saying? It didn't seem mm -hmm. so menacing anymore. And it's like, what a waste of a creature design. I know Guillermo del Toro helped with that design. I know he oh, did yeah. because it looks like it. Ah, Catherine, come on. How do you ruin that creature? Mm -hmm. Damn, you it's wasted it. He used that... her first name. Uh, <laughs> <Catherine>. <laughs> that mm. witch looked like uh, that witch looked like it should be a character or like a enemy or um yeah in Dead by Daylight. Hey Jose, oh yes. yeah, didn't it? Yes. I was like, this yeah. looks like a Dead by Daylight monster. This that. should be totally yeah. just without the rat. Get that. the rat out of here. <laughs> <laughs> George, defend it. Defend this episode. All three of us pooped on it. <laughs> Your turn. Right, so, Jose saw this wasn't high on my list either. This was mid-tier. But the thing, I guess, that resonated with me, uh, I'm a family person. Let's make that clear. And when I say family, I mean I have a brother. I care about my brother very much. I have a tattoo of a dragon. He is the year of the dragon. So siblings are important to me. And I'm a very much a big brother type person where, like, even if you're not related to me, I want to take care of you. So I resonated with that thought of like losing your other half and then trying to like get back to them. Mm -hmm. Granted, I can agree. Rupert Grint is not one of my favorite actors. I, I definitely think that he's he struggles. He peaked at Harry Potter and that was it because everything I've seen him in, he can he shouldn't do American voices. Let's just put it like that. His American voices are horrible. Uh, but I, I, I like it when a bad guy wins. I'm sorry. <sighs> It's, I do too, but that was it doesn't happen often. <laughs> and but I can agree, the rat doesn't look good. I think it should have just been a rat. I think that's what it should have done. Instead of having a, a human face rat, it should have just been a rat. And then it could have been Ratatouille. You, <laughs> you know, that's what I thought of. It made me think of Ratatouille taking over the body instead of just pulling the hair. Though he's inside, he, he's cutting out the middleman. <laughs> so I, I just think that that comedy aspect, and because I didn't expect it, I didn't think anything was gonna be funny in this anthology. It took me by surprise, but I can't disagree I with what you guys are saying. It's all correct. It's, <laughs> you know, it's I, just I, those. George, yeah. What? I got a, what? I got a tattoo for my brother right here too. And I was like, you let your sister yeah. get her to move on. Like, don't try to bring her back into this <laughs> awful world. <laughs> well, our they world is awful. trying to fast forward life. <laughs> they, they were, they were going to have Every a music day. career together. They were going to be a musical duo. Right. I was just like, I was like, I'm like, you're, he wanted, you're selfish. He wanted <laughs> to get his music career back on track. That's what it was. See, that's what it see. My brother plays music. I do some music. I want, I'm still this day, I'm trying to convince my brother to make a musical group with me. So I get it. You gotta, you gotta <laughs> fight for the dream. You gotta... <laughs> I get it. But she, but, but she it, went pretty to far to have a solo career. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she did. More, it's still more, weird though. More soul than anything. Yeah, you had this one higher than the Mandy one. That's what's crazy to me. Like, I understand story. You're not wrong at all. Yeah. I felt the same way with the payoff, but I just thought the other one did so many more technical things right. This one had so many issues with it. You're not wrong. Opinion. It's true. And like I guess if people could see our chat last night, like I wanted to, after I made my list, I was like, I don't know. I think I, yeah. I think I should change it around. It's because mm -hmm. For me, everything here has merit. The one I put at the end to me is just sucks. But there's still something good about it. It's just this is a tough, a tough one. This is one of like the better anthology series that I've seen in a long time. Where mm -hmm. like there's that struggle. This 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 show gave us a struggle of like what's yeah. gonna be the thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's get into favorite scene. Who wants to start us off? Is that you want to start us off? What was your favorite scene in this whole series? Uh I think my favorite scene was the the table scene at the end of the autopsy. Just that like uh that chess match between him and this and this being it was like a david versus goliath but like not the physical version it was the mental version where it was uh this creature was so overconfident that he did not realize like he's getting outsmarted by a lower being 
and again, just how he played those moments where you could tell there was some fear, but then there was also some strategizing happening and then the willingness to sacrifice. Um, everything about that scene worked for me. Yeah, I, I'm going to piggyback off that. That was my favorite, too. I don't want to pick another one. Like, I love the idea behind that where when you strip away man's strength of physical strength or whatnot, and it comes down to just mental, that's always such a fascinating thing to me. Man versus beast, but on a mental standpoint where you're at the creature's mercy. That, to me, is so scary because it takes the wits of man that has to overcompensate a, a creature and being that's smarter than you. But what's ironic is that man is known for their ego, but in this case, the alien got routed by its own ego. And mm -hmm. maybe that's because the alien is that egotistical, or maybe it's been on Earth for a while and has been on man. So man's personality traits are starting to carry over and bleed into the creature. I don't know, but it was still fascinating to watch that. And that's why that's why I ended up loving the third episode so much was because of that final scene. So it, they did it so well. So well. to to add really quick to it with that one of the parts in that scene that I really enjoyed is the guy who he has taken over with and he did all that with uh, right there you got that scene where he he puts his arm with his last bit of energy close enough to him and you see the little tear go down his eyes like he he mm -hmm. went through that suffering and he's just like do this for me do this for all of us like avenge me and that was like yeah. his final thing it's final revenge. Hundred percent. Okay, Marie, you want to go next? Uh, my favorite scene was uh, like the table room scene in the viewing. Uh, that whole scene, uh, I, I kept saying, "What is even happening?" But I loved it, and that whole scene was like was basically revolving around the senses for them and for the viewer because mm -hmm. they are trying mm -hmm. like these this fancy alcohol like the taste and the smell and like the sight the sight with like the drugs and the lens flares. <laughs> i can't get over lens flares guys. Lens really, I, I, I agree. i'm a huge fan of lens flares that's always yeah. some jj abrams stuff i was like, like abrams but well, better <laughs> but it was better than jj way abrams better because like lighting so up well. a, a lighter and it's like pfft, and I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. it gave me like, it, ooh. even Eric Andre, when he drank, he's like, how did you get this perfect? So yeah, even know. that line says everything is is catering to their senses, like everything yes. is amplified it and made them in the yeah. perfect, perfect span of wh where you're just in perfect harmony. That's sort of yeah. what that scene was getting these characters. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Everything was in that scene was about your the senses and like indulgence. And it created this whole feeling of like, it was like sensual feeling, even though the context mm. wasn't sensual. It was like a very like intimate, sensual feeling. You're like, oh yeah, okay. So it's like, yeah, am I on drugs too? Like what's happening here? Like, I don't <laughs> even know. So that scene to me, I was just, I, I just want to go back and watch that scene. That's, mm -hmm. I, I crave that scene, like a drug, mm -hmm. like they did that to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I, Everything else, yeah. but stop about. 15 minutes before the episode ends. Yes. Yep. <laughs> before we enter that room. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to see that monster walking all slow out of a tunnel. I'm like, what? Why is this guy? Like yeah. Everything else before that? Yes. Stick Real it in quick. my veins. You guys, you <laughs> guys walk, you guys walk in that room. What drink is waiting for you? Uh, for me, it'll probably be an uh, old fashioned waiting for me. What's waiting for mm. you guys? Ooh. If I could still drink, I'd say. A Moscow Mule. Mm. Yeah. Moscow Mules are good, yeah. I'd probably go old-fashioned if it's the main one. Yeah, I'd probably go old-fashioned. But Moscow Mules are my second. That's usually what I drink if I'm drinking, drinking, because it's easy on the tummy, man. You don't get hangovers with Moscow Mules. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a hit. <laughs> That's a nod. <laughs> Straight up fact. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see in the comments later. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What about Murray? What's on the table God. for you? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I'm actually really turned on to bourbon. We have like 40, not 40. We have like 20 bourbons in my house right now. So uh, an old, a good old fashioned is really, mm, but it's probably going to be like a cheap bottom shelf vodka and Coke Zero. I walk in there. I'm like, yeah, it's my jam. Party, let's go. <laughs> I didn't even no, know party. this was my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, that'll be the thing, sad thing. To be These are the favorites we pick, but we get something totally different. Uh, pina Colada. <laughs> Okay, I guess yeah. I'll go with it. Hey, I would <laughs> a, a buttery nipple. <laughs> okay. And Chuck made it to the episode. <laughs> there you go. Right. Dan, what's uh what's your scene? 
Uh, it was that one. It was the, the oh, autopsy okay. one. Yeah. The, who did we get to? George? We got yeah, George, George uh, last. We've we we have touched upon it already, and it was from the outside. It was the scene where Martin Starr gets stabbed in the head, mm-hmm. and I uh, I think that's just to retouch on it again. It says, I remember watching it, and I was like, oh, <laughs> I kind of had that jump back of like, mm-hmm. I didn't see you doing that. And now I, I just I had all the feels. It's like, oh damn! Like this, you just you you're killing love. Love just died right now. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's heartbreaking. <laughs> it was. And we've talked about it. I love love. So I late. also love love. <laughs> we all love. I know. Love. I was like crying. Like yes, we learned Jose loves love with his yeah. Moulin Rouge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, don't you bring was... up past episodes, Marie? Sorry. <laughs> Let our viewers it watch back. it. We don't want to spoil it. Go watch if the episode. If you want to see what I'm talking about, go check out this episode. Check out yeah. episode 41. Insert number. It's 40. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Favorite creature design. Who wants to start us off with that one? Marie, you want to start us off with that oh. one? Oh, like the scariest monster? Mm-hmm. Whatever one is your favorite monster. You. My favorite monster. Well, to me, the scariest monsters were the women in the outside because they are the most realistic. There's people like that in real life. I feel like there's a part of those that monster inside of all of us. So anyone's capable of turning into that. Not me, not anyone, but a lot of people are capable. Those monsters, those women walk amongst us right now. So <laughs> that they, those women scared the <laughs> crap out Karen. of me. They, they live. Call Karen. Yes. Yeah. They live. Yeah. Those. <laughs> But like really rich, um, scary Karen. Yeah, I, I the, them, those women. Good answer. <laughs> good answer, George. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> See, her your answer was nice and deep. My my answer is is definitely all cosmetic, and it's just the the demon from Lot Thirty Six. Mm. Like I, yeah. I thought it looked really freaking cool. Thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Like I want to, Very I want to actually choice. draw it afterwards. For me, that's mm-hmm. a big thing. If I want to, if I see something that's really cool and I want to draw it myself, mm-hmm. that's like, all right, you just think awesome there. Mm-hmm. I want to recreate what you did. That was my favorite thing of that episode. Was yeah. that was a creature design. I loved it. Same. Yeah, and I've mm-hmm. I've been in those kind of lots before and everything because a uh, a person I I worked for who did a uh, like a what's it called production art for movies. He would put his mm-hmm. comic books in those places, so I'd help them with all that. And it that feeling of like a maze, desolate, dark and dingy. Mm-hmm. It's not a place you want to put anything, honestly. It's really <laughs> they're really gross. Even newer ones aren't clean. I don't know what what the deal is with those places, but yeah, like it captured that. And then that monster living in there, it's like yeah, that's where that monster belongs. It belongs in mm-hmm. there. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I always had an uneasy feeling about going to those. <laughs> okay, Jose. Uh for me, it was it was a tie between the lot 36 creature and as bad as it was the witch the from witch, the witch yeah. house those mm-hmm. two were the best designs for me um now it the creature from lot 36 it, it, there, was, there was a resemblance is that the same creature that was uh on the wall cave yes. of the graveyard rats Yes, it that's what like I it. saw. It, it as. definitely looked I like saw, it. I, I it looked the like thing. exactly the same creature. Yeah. So, yeah. but but those two, I feel the design of those were it was it was creepy. It looked realistic. Those those are my favorite. Okay, um, I, Jose, I feel like you and I had pretty similar. <laughs> Our ranking system must be pretty <laughs> damn close, man. I felt the same way. That was my favorite design. But since you already talked about it, I'll talk about the giant rat. Was so yes. disgusting to me. That oh. the episode was good, but it was so disgusting. That one kind of left a lasting impression on me because it was so gross. That one physically made was revolting to me. It looks so realistic and it's so I associate rats with disease. Yeah. So it just plays off that like and it just the 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 gross saliva globs that was coming out of it. Like they did such yeah. a good job. And then just a cool visual. Was in um was it Pikmin's model just at the end when we talked about the wife with the eyeballs ripped out? It mm-hmm. was just a cool visual looking, not necessarily a monster, but oh that rat man, the rat was so gross to me. Visually, the rat's <laughs> my favorite too. And you're right mm-hmm. with the the yeah uh, very xenomorph with that spit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, very very. <laughs> to, to add to the to the the rat thing because I know we didn't talk about that episode. Um, uh, I really appreciated in that when he was in the tunnel with that rat. How the mm-hmm. director did all these like really close up shots, which gave mm-hmm. you that claustrophobic 
like yeah. feeling in there yeah. there was no, even when there was a long tunnel there was really no pull away everything was really close so you felt mm -hmm. like you were contained there like i had to add a mention that with the with the rat thing that was really cool yeah absolutely yeah. so any final thoughts before we close this out i want to give an honorable mention to the murmuring I actually really like that episode because it's the only one that gave me watery eyes that made me scared enough to give me water eyes. I cried because it's so emotional and it's like relatable as a parent. It's relatable as if you're in a relationship ever in your life. And uh, it visually, it was so beautiful. And I, right away, I'm like, this was filmed in Canada. And it was, I could tell right away when they're on that canoe, I'm like, it's in Canada. <laughs> that was a Babadook, right? That was a Babadook. Yeah. Yeah. Was yeah. Right. yeah. 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 Je Jennifer Kent was on that, was that like one. Mm -hmm. Used the same actress too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. To me, that one had the best acting performances yep. out of yes. all oh, of them. I know. Was... Those mm -hmm. two. And that was like the opposite of what you were mentioning earlier, George, with uh, The Outsider. Here, you saw verbal and you saw action yeah, on the caring definitely. aspect of it, really trying. So there you see the different dynamic of two different uh, relationships. But mm -hmm. the, act, the acting was on point. The acting carried... because. Mm -hmm. Not a lot happened in the movie if you really break it down, but the acting was so good that it carried it throughout until something happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I also yeah. feel I'm I'm a put one of the small group of one person who despises the Babadook, and I feel like I'm not meant to like that actress. I feel <laughs> like their their I'm goal is now. for me to never like her, never to like the director. <laughs> I'm just not meant to like them. I admit, good things happen. Yes, mm -hmm. there's good directing and everything, good acting. Uh, and maybe it's because of the story. The, the stories that, that they write and that they end up having to do. I'm just like, am I meant to hate you? Is that my purpose in life? Is to just hate you? Because I hated her so much. Yeah. <laughs> so, so <laughs> well, much. And I think it's because Guillermo... of that fact. Because she's she's so standoff. Like she's, she's going through that inner turmoil. And they're not connecting with each other. I'm in a relationship where we're connecting. I always talk. We, like, we're always putting our, our emotions out there. So to see a relationship where they're not conversing and getting that connection, it hurts. It's like, why yeah, don't you but, just talk to each other? That's <laughs> what's so fascinating. And that's what makes it good. I get it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But it, it depends how you view me. it. <laughs> because if, you, if you've been on the other side, you can see it. And sure, maybe they exaggerate a little bit, but you can see how realistic that is because the average person doesn't do proper communication. Yeah, Most relationships fail because of lack of communication. So to see that element that's completely realistic and you, you can really sympathize with the characters. And that's how I felt with Babadook. That's why I loved Babadook because this was a very, very realistic portrayal that we saw of the mother. I felt like now is it as happy is she doing all the right moves not at all she's a flawed oh, character no. and that's yeah. what makes it so interesting to mm -hmm. me but cool Guillermo del Toro ones? wrote that one right he wrote the murmuring right he wrote that yes I think. yep yeah right you can tell yep. you can tell he yeah. wrote that one and lot 36 those are both okay. from his short stories I really like lot 36 too lot 36 yeah. was pretty, it was up there for me all right okay. you guys ready for the Final rankings. Yeah, I want to hear episodes. this, man. Final <laughs> rankings. For this. <laughs> so for, for the audience, this is, uh, we all ranked all our episodes, including Chuck, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. Um, and this is our cumulative ranking. So they're hearing this for the first time. At number eight, Dreams in the Witch House. That was <laughs> far behind. At number seven, The Murmuring. Oh, <laughs> oh. at number six Pickman's model at number five lot 36 at number four the outside at number three graveyard rats at number two the viewing oh wow wow at number one the autopsy Dude, Jose, you and I okay. must have had really close things because, like, that's pretty much my list. Well, this is Maybe. cumulative of well, because all of five of us. Yeah, no, all the, five the, of us. The, the, that's, that's what two. I'm saying. That, that means at least two or three of us got really similar lists then because mm -hmm. it's pretty much dead on with what my rankings were. Yeah. Well, Chuck must, have the view, the, Chuck must have had the view. Chuck had the viewing up. Yeah. Two, for sure. yeah. yeah. He definitely had yeah. it like at one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was his number one. Yeah. 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 Was the viewing. He loved Mandy. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I get good, it. Though. So, good. <laughs> yeah, good. So, good. so I'm the one who brought the viewing down a, a, a one notch, then probably, huh? 
Well, it was at two, right? I didn't have yeah. the viewing as number one. You, you and me, George. We brought okay. it down. Okay. Good job, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are hating on filmmaking. <laughs> it's my aesthetic, All right. guys. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what's your ranking? Let us know yeah. what what you guys like because we might be completely wrong on how we viewed the witch episode with <laughs> Rupert Grins. You guys might feel he did a phenomenal job. Uh -huh. Let us know how we're wrong because the great thing about all this is that it's all subjective, right? We all you see how different we viewed different things, like the viewing. Me and Marie loved it. Jose and George are incorrect on this. So you see how <laughs> you see how we all differentiate on this. Thank you for watching another episode of Not a Strong Start. You can follow us. Please like, subscribe, comment, share on our YouTube channel, Not a Strong Start. Please follow us on Instagram and Twitter, Not a Strong Start. I'm your host, Daniel DeSangre. You can follow me at King underscore Sangre. I'm Jose Ramos. You can find me at This Is Me Nombre on Instagram. Uh, I'm Marie, and I will have my name up there next time, I promise. And they can follow you at? <laughs> Oh yeah, sorry. You can follow me at at Marie Plays It All. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I am George. You can follow me at Nicolopolis. And as always, all these tags will be on our description, so you can click down there and check us all out. And definitely hit those notes because we are still dropping bonus content. We're also going to be rolling out new spinoff shows, so we get excited about that. So a lot of new material coming up. So thanks everybody for watching. Bye.